I'm David Lawson, I'm the Chief Procurement Officer uh, for Gu Guys and St. Thomas's. Um, if you don't know Guys and St. Thomas's, major teaching hospital um, across four sites, um, 1.6 billion uh, turnover. We employ about 26,000 uh, staff. Um, I manage a, a procurement shared service, um, um, manage about 200, um, 200 staff and look after about um, 600 million in terms of non-pay spend. So, so that's kind of guys and Tommy's. And I guess my presentation is, is to kind of just walk through our journey in terms of healthcare and, and supply chain. Um, and from the last kind of like 10 to 15 years up to the kind of pandemic. Um, and then I'll talk about our kind of experience during, during that global kind of, kind of pandemic and then where we are today in terms of post-pandemic and, and looking at particularly around um, supply chain resilience. Um, and I've got a couple of um, kind of case studies which are basically what we were doing last month just to kind of give a flavour of kind of current work um, in terms of healthcare and, 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 and supply chain. Um, I'll just wait for some colleagues to, to join as well. So I'm not expecting you to be able to read this slide, um, but if I go back, I, mean, I joined Guys and Tommies in 2001, so this is, um, this is, kind, of, this is kind of ancient history really, but um, if, I, if, if we look at 2004, um, this was a, a, an analysis of our kind of supply chain within our kind of main theatres at Guy's Hospital. And, and for a hospital, um, theatres are very much the kind of engine room of, of, of the hospital. And what you're seeing is, is an illustration of a very manual process where literally you had um, nursing staff in theatres checking storerooms, working out what to order, filling out paper requisitions, um, using internal mail or the fax machine, um, send them to the procurement team who then manually enter that information into ordering systems, sometimes post those orders to the suppliers um, or fax them. Um, at the time, the auto fax was the, the, the big innovation um, in the hospital. Products arrive, and then what you're seeing here is kind of buffer inventory. And when we looked at this process, um, one of the difficulties is because it was a manual process, the, a, lot of the hidden, a lot of the costs were hidden, um, but we estimated the level of waste was around 20%, 20% of what we buy. And if you imagine the NHS across the country spends about four billion in terms of clinical supplies and these kind of products, it's quite a high kind of risk of wastage. And we also found a combination of um, excess stock and therefore the risk of product going out of date, but also stock outs as well, because we had no kind of systems in place. So that was our kind of like starting point. Um, and even today, there are some hospitals that have a manual process which looks kind of like this. So this risk of waste is, is, is still with us in terms of different parts of, um, parts of the NHS. What did we do? Um, so we deployed, um, automated inventory system. So we, we did what was called a kind of full house implementation um, across both clinical supplies and, and, and medicines. We deployed about 500 of these automated systems. Um, and essentially what happened was uh, the process works where clinical teams will go into the system um, through kind of biometric access. And then as product is removed, um, the systems will automatically reorder against a PAR. So it's, it's quite a basic uh, process, but it provided a level of visibility that we never had before. Um, in terms of the outcomes, we, we measured about 125,000 hours of nursing time which was saved when, when we deployed the system. Um, we saw our, our kind of ordering volume, um, uh, our value of orders go down by about 10% because we weren't over ordering. Um, and our waste level now is, uh, which we can measure because we've got visibility, is, is below 1%. In, in terms of waste. And, and I guess the context for healthcare supply chain is that clinical supplies are in sterile packaging, which usually lasts about three, three years, three to five years. So it's very important to kind of maintain the kind of stock turn um, to, to avoid waste. So that's what we did back in uh, 2009. Um, and I guess over the last um, kind of decade, we've been kind of automating um, optimizing the processes and, and kind of getting more and more lean. So the top half of this um, slide shows um, the kind of 
dis receipt and distribution area at St. Thomas Hospital um, in the basement. And this is around just having discipline around basic process, clear deck policy. Products arrive today, it gets, um, it gets receipted um, and put away the same day. Um, and then September, October uh, 2019, um, we set up an off-site logistics center um, in Dartford to consolidate inbound deliveries. We, we measured, um, we counted the amount of volume of uh, delivery trucks into our, into our two main loading bays at uh, St. Thomas Hospital and Guy's, and we, we worked out that we, we were receiving a delivery every three, uh, every three minutes a van or truck delivery was hitting the loading bay. So um, major issue around congestion. Um, and so, so I guess the story until kind of February 2020 when we had the kind of global pandemic was around um, automating our processes and trying to get more and more lean and more and more efficient in terms of process, process control. Um, and then we had the kind of global pandemic, um, which I can't believe is like two, it's over two years, two years ago now. It kind of feels, still feels kind of, um, we were still in it, but um, it, it was two years ago. This is just the kind of illustration of what what, what was kind of in, in the news at that time, and, and it was very much around, um, from a supply chain perspective, almost like the collapse of, of, of the supply chain. Um, just to give a specific example, so one of the key products that we required um, during the pandemic was what's called an FFP-free mask, and essentially it's a, um, it, it's a mask that's, that, that's required um, if you're in kind of critical care, where you've got COVID patients to, to avoid the risk of kind of um, um, getting, kind of, getting COVID through, through airborne uh, particles. So FFP3 mask was the, was the kind of key product that, that, that we required. Um, early February uh, 2020, we were consuming about 100 of these masks a week. By the end of February, we were consuming about 5,000 of those masks per day. So you had this massive um, and sudden um, spike in demand for quite a small number of products, whether it's uh, FFP3 masks or um, you know, it's, um, kind of gowns and, and so forth. So quite a narrow group of products in terms of PPE products. But because that demand kind of increased so quickly, the national kind of supply chain just wasn't able to cope and, and, and collapse pretty quickly. Um, and also, as well as um, the, the NHS, the hospitals requiring these products, the, um, the, you also had kind of social care, so all these care homes in the community were also required to adopt PPE protocols. And, and the, the national kind of supply chain in the NHS was, was, was being asked to also supply this wider group um, of, 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 of users. So we had a, a fairly quick, um, position where, where, the, where the national supply chain was kind of overwhelmed. Um, what, what, did, what did that look like at St. Thomas's? So we had, um, this is where the army trucks comes in in terms of the title. We had, um, we were at a point um, just after lockdown where I was at St. Thomas Hospital and we worked out we had about six hours worth of supply of these, uh, of these FFP3 masks. Um, and so we had some early, some previous discussions with um, the army who'd just been asked to kind of support uh, the, uh, the DH. Um, and we used those contacts to say, can you help? Um, and they described it as, their, as uh, the break glass option, you know, call us if you need help. So we broke the glass and, 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 and called them. So they, they delivered um, some FFP3 masks um, into St. Thomas's um, in these massive um, army trucks. Um, we, 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 we have a film crew from the BBC on, in, in tow as well, I, I might add. I, I guess the context for me, though, is that in terms of resolving those immediate shortages, the army, although they helped, they only delivered, in, in those two big trucks, they only actually delivered half a pallet of, the, of these masks. There's about 4,000 masks um, that they, they actually delivered, so less than a day's worth of supply. Um, we asked for about 50,000 and, and we got 4,000. The reason why we didn't run out was because we also um, called on our kind of other hospitals in London. And we use a term in the NHS called mutual aid. And so we called on the mutual aid um, 
from, from other hospitals in London. And, and on the same day as the, arm, the big army trucks um, delivered the half pallet, we also received about 30,000 masks from other um, hospitals in London, particularly um, Imperial, I think, um, and St. George's. And perhaps one of the kind of hidden stories around how the NHS coped in these early kind of weeks and months of, of, of the pandemic, you know, why didn't hospitals actually run out in the end? It was very much part of the story was around the use of mutual aid, where hospitals kind of worked at a local level to kind of share inventory that, that, that they had to kind of keep going. Um, and it's very much one of the kind of, kind of hidden stories of, 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 of those early days. Um, but it makes a great picture for a presentation to have, the, have these huge army trucks. Just to kind of add, the, add to the pressure um, at, at this time, um, we also had this, let, let's see if this works of coronavirus. So just breaking news coming into us within the past few seconds. Uh, the Prime Minister has been under the care of uh, doctors in a hospital in London and he is being now admitted into intensive care with those persistent symptoms of coronavirus. Uh, he has been in hospital since Sunday evening. We were expecting him to say, stay in the hospital for a second night in this hospital, St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, but we heard earlier on from his tweets that he was uh, doing well and we heard also from Dominic Raab earlier on that he was in still very much in charge of what was happening now Laura Koonsberg our political editor joined so I won't I won't go into the the, 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 the um, keep that going but I, I guess I guess the the context in terms of where we were is, is the pressure kind of increased when you have the uh, your, your country's prime minister also become a patient um, it's amazing how how improved the security was um, when, 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 when Boris, Boris arrived. Um, the, so we, we, at a local level, we started, um, um, because we were, we're getting about f between 30 to 40% of our demand was arriving through the national system at this point. So we had to do something about it. So we relied on mutual aid. And we also started buying direct as well. Um, we used our contacts with uh, Virgin Care. The chairman of our joint venture that we partly own um, fortunately became the chairman of Virgin Care um, the, the previous uh, Christmas. And so we used those contacts to persuade Virgin Atlantic to borrow one of their planes and point it towards Shanghai um, rather than New York. And Virgin Charity agreed to pay for the fuel. And then the Department of Health subsequently took on that arrangement um, to, to also uh, air freight products. So we started buying direct um, um, and, and flying things from, from Shanghai. And I guess from an NHS trust perspective, that was our kind of first exposure to kind of international sourcing. So it's quite a, quite a steep learning curve in terms of trying to do this stuff. Um, we also um, set up a, a 3D um, a print farm. So in our supply chain hub in, in Dartford that we set up uh, the previous year, we, we set up 200 uh, 3D printers. Um, and this picture here is a, a Maxa, this is like a reusable respirator that is used in critical care. And this is an alternative to these FFP3 masks, which are kind of single use. But one of the aspects of these, of these um, reusable respirators is they have this little plastic clip, which you can see here. Um, and the way that these masks work is that there's a, a, there is a single use visor that you have to kind of rip off after you've done a 12 hour shift. And, and these little brackets kept breaking. And we was, we just couldn't get them replaced because the supplier was based in America. So we started printing these um, in our 3D print farm to kind of keep our fleet of reusable respirators going. And we made other, other products um, like ear protectors as well. Well, um, if you imagine nurses um, with these, um, these uh, single-use masks on for 12-hour shifts, you, you, you saw the pictures on the news with um, kind of uh, bruising on, on the face. So ear protectors help to, help to make it more comfortable. Um, and, we, and we did mutual aid. So, that, so the inventory that we bought from China, um, we, we also um, um, gave that out to about 45 hospitals across London. Um, and, and overall, we were able to donate about a million items of PPE from, from, from the efforts. And this is very much the, the kind of hidden story around COVID, around it, this process of, um, of mutual aid. So that was COVID. Um, and I think after about six months, supply began, began, began to stabilize. 
what we've now been doing over the last kind of 12, 18 months is kind of building our kind of supply chain resilience. Um, so we've set up a, an in-house wholesaler now in terms of our, our um, this is a picture inside our, our supply chain hub. That supplies about 50% of our theatres um, in terms of our inventory now. It provides a month's worth of buffer. And that's one of the big challenges around um, our supply chain today. It's around resilience. Um, and and I'll, I've got a case study I'll talk about shortly, which, which kind of illustrates um, how fragile our supply chain is um, today. Also speaks to about um, folks on sustainability, but also looking at different ways to um, get things from A to B. So we've had a kind of interesting riverboat pilot um, over last, um, last year. We've been trying electric trucks as well. And I guess in the NHS is that there is a big push around sustainability. There's a kind of net zero targets um, over, over the next few years. So I'm just going to just talk about, just to, just to give an insight uh, in terms of what the hospital does and then see, and just very quickly kind of articulate what that means from a supply chain perspective. So this is a, a, a video, uh, I won't play the whole video for time, but this, um, so Ben is our kind of robot surgeon and we're the largest robotic center um, in the country. We have uh, six surgical robots operating, but I'll just play the clip just to give a, a kind of sense of what actually happens inside the hospital. Um, and Ben is sat inside the theater um, at Guy's and you can see the kind of automated cabinets um, behind him. But I'll just play a bit of this just to give you a flavor of what it's like to, to kind of be in a hospital. I'm Ben Chalicum. I'm one of the uh, consultant neurologists at Guy's and I'm also one of the robotic surgeons. So the robotic surgery program at Guy's and St. Thomas's has been uh, going now for 13 years. It's the, the longest program in the UK. Almost 3,000 patients have been treated with robotic surgery here. We treat mainly prostate cancer in terms of the highest percentage but also have a very strong program for both bladder and for kidney cancer and for some other rarer cancers that we see within the uh, urological group. So robotic surgery is really just a variation on standard laparoscopic, i.e. keyhole surgery. It uses the same small holes in the patient's skin, the same small scars, but instead of long straight instruments controlled by the individual surgeon that can kind of just go left and right and up and down, little tiny arms go in that are controlled by the surgeon but away from the patient. These arms have actually got a higher range of motion and they're connected to a machine called a robot and the surgeon actually operates from a console that can be several meters. I should have said if you're screaming, you probably should look away now. So sorry about that. Um, so that, that's the type of stuff we're doing. And what's interesting though is that in terms of if you think of supply chain, this is, this is the supply chain for the, the consumables that are used for that procedure um, last, last month. And if you want a case study about how fragile healthcare supply chain can be, this is probably a good example. And this is a real example that we had to grapple with um, last month. The implications of which were that if we couldn't solve it, we would have to cancel um, cancer surgery. And, and, and that, 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 that's the kind of reality in terms of the kind of environment we're working in. So in this situation, you had um, back order issues in the manufacturing facility in Mexico. Um, because of problems in getting uh, shortages of getting uh, core raw materials, which was creating production delays. At the same time, their, their European uh, distribution centre had a ransomware attack, which meant that although they had inventory, the system wouldn't, wasn't able to kind of automatically pick it or find where it was in this kind of huge warehouse. And then in the same week, they had a UK warehouse um, where there's a spike in co another spike in COVID cases. So we had this kind of situation where we were unable to potentially get supply. How did we manage through that? So again, it goes back to mutual aid, where we, we, we were kind of borrowing uh, boxes of, of product from, um, from Scotland and, and various other places. Um, we, were look, we actually changed, the, the clinical team changed their practice for some products where they used alternative products and they had to quite quickly do risk assessments, do the change. Um, and then longer term, what's interesting is that um, these companies are beginning to increase their look going back, going from single use consumables to reusable. Um, some, so some of the products that we were running out of, there, are, there is the ability to have reusable options. And, and so again, we're looking at changing our, how we're, the actual products and our, our reliance on this kind of 
um, extended supply chain by, by, by kind of going back to a process of having reusable products that we have more control over. Um, just stay quickly, another example, just the work we're doing, so Ukraine, um, we have a lot of clinicians who have connections back into Poland and Ukraine. So we've been donating um, surplus uh, clinical supplies to, to, the, to the effort in Ukraine. Picture here is actually um, clinicians, registrars, consultants who, who helped kind of prioritize the inventory that we had available to prioritize what should be shipped into, Pol and, into Poland and Ukraine. And we've been supporting these hospitals directly um, with clinical supplies um, over, over, over last kind of last month with volunteers driving into, um, in, in, into those hospitals direct. Um, so that's, that's kind of healthcare supply chain. It's, it's, um, I guess what's interesting is when people ask me what's, what's my strategy for supply chain, the answer is um, make it boring because in reality it is too exciting, it is too interesting and what we want to do is kind of stabilize it and have have it very boring, very predictable, and, and that's very much the strategy that, 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 that we're trying to get to. Um, how, how do we do that? Part of it is around visibility. You know, we can only see what we can see. Um, we have lots of data of our inventory systems that we don't share with our suppliers. Suppliers have lots of data around their supply chain that they don't share, share with us. So we're trying to look at how we kind of have visibility of our end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, it's also about our team as well, so uh, Bob um, in the previous presentation talked about people. Um, people are it's actually crucial in terms of our supply chain um, to, to invest in our people, so we, we've got various kind of um, education programs that we're running in the hospital to kind of invest in our people and creating the right career paths um, for our team to, 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 to progress. Um, and we're also in competition. We're in competition with other sectors for supply chain talent. So, we, so, we, so we, we're very conscious, conscious of, of trying to um, attract and retain talent um, within the team. Um, and also, you know, we're going to keep innovating and trying different ideas. So we're, we're due to um, start a pilot of a drone, uh, drones uh, between our supply chain hub and, and the hospitals later in the summer. And we've got other ideas, particularly around sustainability. Um, that, 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 that we're, we're, we're kind of pushing forward, particularly around switching from single use to, to reusable. Um, I've overrun, um, so apologies for that. So key points, I guess, um, for the last 10 years, it's all, all, all been about being, being lean um, and getting more efficient. Um, I think the pandemic for hospitals has highlighted the importance of resilience. It's also highlighted the importance of supply chain as a function as well within the organization. Um, Post-pandemic, our supply chain remains very fragile, and I kind of gave the example of, of robotic surgery. And what's our strategy? Well, let's try and make it boring, I, I guess, is, is, is the honest answer. So I'll, I'll close there. Apologies for overrunning. It's all right. Well, uh, thank you so much, David. I've got loads of questions. I suspect mine are more naive than everybody else's. Um, does anybody want to start from the audience with one? Amazing, already two up front. I think uh, to you first, and then on to you. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you for everything that the NHS has been doing over the last couple okay. of years. It's really amazing. Um, but also, you've obviously talked about how you um, had to diversify. So you had your central distribution hub, but then you had to look at mutual aid and purchasing privately, and also manufacturing your own pieces through 3D printing. How are you taking that forward as part of your longer term strategy, are you building those in as part of your resilience um, approach? Yeah, yeah, we are. I mean, I, I think what we've identified is the learning, I guess, is, is, is not to be reliant on one, one, one approach as well and having a, almost like a range of options. So we're still, we'll still retain the level of capability around 3D printing. Um, we're, we're kind of linking it now with sustainability. So. We, I, it, what was clear is our dependency on single-use products manufactured in distant parts of the world, whether it's China or, 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 or other places. So trying to improve our resilience by not having that dependency, so, so, so using single-use. And, and also then creating our own buffer, effectively, um, which you know, a few years ago would have been uh, seen as, as a bad thing to do because you're kind of creating this risk of waste and, and it's a cost and it's an overhead. But, it's more important for the hospital to have reliable supply. That, that the, risk, the implications of not having that are, are far worse 
particularly around the backlog in terms of electric recovery now. So, and also the other part is maintaining links with other colleagues within you know, other hospitals um, so that if, as and when issues happen, we can, we can lean on, those, on, on, that, on that network to, to, to have kind of short-term solutions. Yeah. Excellent, and the gentleman over there. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Probably can hear me from any, any ways to yeah. the front. <laughs> I had a very similar question about mutual aid, um, David. An excellent presentation, by the way, so thank you for that. I'd just be curious from how you're sort of learning or taking learnings from the other hospitals as well and sort of building that into your resilience as well, because I think there's a massive opportunity to do that, not just through the mutual aid, but also through the innovation, the collective ideas of, of the boroughs. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, as hospitals, particularly teaching hospitals, we kind of almost believe our own, our own kind of PR that we're the best, you know, we're the best teaching hospital. And our, and our consultant teams don't help us because they think they are the best. Um, and, and so it is, um, I think the important thing is, is maintaining those relationships. And then it's sharing information, sharing data. Um, and that, that's really the challenge, I think, in the NHS. And the NHS you think of a single organisation, it's quite siloed. You know, there's over 200 separate acute hospitals, all with separate inventory systems, separate processes, separate finance systems. So there's a, it's very fragmented, and therefore it's quite challenging to kind of share data. Um, and the way that we, we kind of classify data is also, also kind of not consistent as well. So I think the key is to identify like-minded organisations, similar organisations that we can work with and, and share ideas, and, and we get learning from that, and they hopefully get learning from us as well. Uh, we've got, I think, ten questions in from online, so I think I'll, I'll switch to that, two of them. Uh, first of all, what is the plan for logistics and sustainability for GSTT with SIVA Logistics? Um, so I, I guess the plan with, so we set up the off-site logistics centre, very much targeting on consolidating inbound delivery. Where we are now is seeing it as an, an asset for the wider organization to locate services off-site increasingly. So the challenge for big hospitals in inner city locations is lack of space. So the more services that we can take off-site means that we can use this on-site space for kind of its primary purpose around you know, patient care. Um, so, so the next kind of steps with, 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 with the SIVA logistics facility is, is to have it as a multi-purpose facility. Um, and, we, and other supply chains, I've talked a lot about clinical supply chain. So the, our IT department have a separate supply chain where they manage end user devices. So they're moving their end user device management into the same hub and, and to manage and adopt the same processes. We have a pharmacy team with, um, who are looking at a, a new regional facility for aseptics, which is kind of manufacturing chemotherapy drugs. They're seeing Dartford as a potential option to locate that facility because there's no space on site. So it's kind of multi, using the facility for a multi-purpose use for the hospital. Brilliant. Um, and one final question. How will your mutual aid protocol develop with new insights from the pandemic? Um, I think the key is, is having better visibility of what the true inventory levels are in different hospitals. That's the one thing we don't have in clinical supplies. If you look at pharmacy, pharmacy through Brexit created a surveillance system. So during the pandemic, they had real time visibility at a local and national level of where every of the quantities of every medicine in every hospital around the country. And I guess for clinical supplies, we need to get to the same level of visibility to facilitate you know, mutual aid. Uh, brilliant. Well, I mean, it's, it's a shame we don't have another couple of hours because I think we could keep going. But I'm sure everybody will come find you, uh, as will I. David, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.